Hey everybody, welcome back to Completely Bored. Today we're looking at Champions of Midgard. This is a worker placement game with a Viking theme. It's designed by Ole Steinness, hopefully I'm pronouncing his name right, and it's published by Gray Fox Games. Now in this game, you're going to have a number of workers that you're gonna be placing out on the board. And you're trying to collect different types of resources, and some of those resources are dice. And those dice represent different types of Viking warriors, some are better than others. And then once you've placed all your workers, you're going to assign your Viking dice to various battles around the board, should you choose to do so. And then you're gonna roll those dice to resolve the combat, and hopefully you will be able to defeat monsters before they kill your Vikings off and gain uh, glory points, victory points. Uh, the game lasts eight rounds, so it's a fairly brief game. It plays pretty fast, and it plays uh, two to four players. So here's what we'll do. We're gonna take you to the table. Uh, we're gonna show you some of the cards and all the worker placement spaces and how the game kind of works. And then when we're done, we'll come back and I'll tell you what I think. So before we get started, let's show you some of the components. Um, they give you this quick reference guide. Um, it shows you the backs of the cards and what they look like. Um, and on the back side is the iconography uh, for the different uh, resources and the dice. Um, once you've played the game, you know, uh, once you won't really need that anymore. Uh, once you've chosen your start player, uh, the person to the right of the start player would choose one of these five uh, Viking leaderboards and then would pass to the right and the first player would go last in choosing who they'd like to be. And these all have various special abilities. So for example, uh, this guy here, Gilfer, uh, he doesn't have to pay anything when he goes to the merchant ship to collect goods. Um, the space on the board where you'd have to pay uh, a certain number of gold, for example, to get a die or wood or food or what have you. He doesn't have to pay anything, so that's kind of cool. That's Gilfer. Uh, next is Asmunder. Asmunder, he gains two glory points or victory points uh, whenever he spends a favor token to reroll. So favor tokens, which allow for rerolls, are his jam, so that's kind of cool. Uller, the Berserker, uh, he gains a glory point each time uh, you roll a one or two more, or more hit results in a round of battle. So when he does a lot of damage, he gets additional glory because he's that kind of Viking. Uh, the two women in the game are Dagrun, the Destined, and she gets to draw an additional uh, Destiny card when visiting the Sage Hut. So she can uh, take two and pick which one she wants and discard the other one. And last but not least is Von Hilder. Uh, she, uh, whenever she gets hit results on a white die, uh, like so, she gets a additional one additional damage. So she's really good with swords. Um, so those are the player boards. That's what they look like. And on the flip side um, is, you know, again a picture of what they look like, as well as their special ability and uh, places for dice, because you can only have up to um, eight die uh, in your Viking posse, as it were. That would be it. Svan Hildur can't have any more Vikings in that uh, working with her. So those are the player boards. Next, I'll show you some of the monster cards. Uh, for example, the troll cards here. Um, all the, the enemy cards are basically set up the same. In the top right corner is a blue value. That value is what you're trying to hit against. So for example, if I came at this thing with one die like this and I rolled it and I rolled a two, if I can find it, if I can, there we go, and I rolled a two, I would kill this monster. But before I kill the monster, he does damage to me in, uh, with this number here, which means he would destroy one of the die, in this case, just the one. So I lose this die, but I did defeat him. I would get three glory points for defeating him, as well as a wood resource, and I would get to assign a, a blame token to some other player at the table. And we'll talk more about that and what that means. And those are the trolls, uh, the troll guys, the troll uh, monsters. The next are the draugers, they're kind of like zombies. Um, and they're, again, set up the same way. Two, uh, I have to try to get a two, and uh, if I came at him like this with two dice and I rolled that, I would defeat him with two, but he's going to destroy one of my die in the, in the process. And I would get four glory points as well as two gold. 
Now you notice down here at the bottom, there's a symbol with a red X through it. Basically all that means is in this particular case, there's an ax symbol. It means I cannot use a black die to defeat uh, this Draugr. Um, there's other ones with spears or swords. You get the idea. Whatever the red X is through, you cannot, you cannot use that particular die to defeat that monster. Okay. Um, lastly, uh, you'll notice there's a symbol here in the middle. Uh, that's uh, those symbols were added in the second edition for um, colorblind players uh, because there are bonuses if you have sets of yellow, red, blue, and so they added those symbols uh, for the colorblind. That's what those are. And lastly are the uh, these monsters, which we'll show you. Which uh, uh, these are the this is the monster deck. And again, set up the same way, but the values are much higher. They're much higher to, harder to defeat. And of course, they're worth a lot more uh, glory points because they're harder to get to, which we'll show you because you're gonna need a boat and various Vikings and food to feed them to get across the ocean to defeat this. In this particular case, you'll notice there's an X through the sword. So I can't use any white dice on this particular monster. I can only defeat him with red and black dice. And if I can defeat him, I get 15 glory points and a favor token, which I could use on a future turn to reroll my dice. So those are the uh, those are the monster cards. Pretty straightforward. Um, and I showed you the dice. You know, there's basically three different types of dice. There's swordsmen, uh, which have three blank sides, and um, as well as a shield, which can block uh, block an attack by a monster. There's red spearmen. Uh, with uh, two blank sides and a shield, and the black die, which is the Axeman, he has uh, he has two uh, blank sides and lots of axes, but no shield. So he can't really defend himself well, but he can attack uh, really well. So that's pretty much that. So let's uh, clean everything out of the way, and we'll put the board down, and we'll show you the worker spaces. So as you can see, this board is fairly large. I had to turn it sideways to get it uh, folding into the camera view. And um, I think what I'll do is I'll turn it and I'll zoom in on different areas to show you the different spaces and what they do and uh, kind of describe how the gameplay works uh, as I do that. So you can see here there's different worker spaces uh, where you can collect different resources or gain dice or food. Uh, as well as spaces where you can get cards. I'll show you what those do. And then there's spaces where you can fight trolls or droggers or get your long ships ready to, do, uh, to go across the ocean here, make their voyage to fight the monsters that are down here. As you can see here, the hunting grounds, there's four circles. So you can place uh, one worker here, but up to four players can place their workers there. And once all their workers have been placed, then you can assign Vikings to the, to the space. And uh, you can uh, assign as many Vikings as you want. And then you would uh, roll. And for every success that you had, you would gain uh, that much food. So in this space here, uh, this is where you'd fight the troll. So one player would allow to be allowed to put one worker there. And they can assign Vikings to this space uh, to fight this troll when the time came. And if they were to roll, let's say they rolled, oh, I don't know, I'm gonna jinx the dice here a little bit. Let's say they rolled one spearman and they rolled a double ax. If they did do that, the double ax is enough to defeat the troll, but the troll gets to fight back in his dying breath and he would destroy, with a level of two, he would destroy both of these Viking dice. You would get five glory points for defeating the troll, as well as a wood resource, and you get to assign this blame token. Now the blame token goes to any player uh, who didn't uh, assign a worker, which obviously wouldn't be you because only one player can go there at a time. And over time, uh, these uh, become uh, negative points over time and they escalate. So one of is only a minus one, but two become minus three. And if you have six or more of these, you're looking at minus 21 points. So you want to get rid of these and assign them to other people. Next is the Draugr space. So there'd be Draugr cards here like this, and you'd have two cards like so. In this particular case, Two workers can be assigned here, um, and then when the workers have been assigned, then you would assign dice to each one 
however you want to assign them. Uh, and then combat resolution, you would roll to see if you'd win. I'll roll this one, let's say. So in this particular case, uh, the yellow player defeated this Draugr, but he lost his, his uh, Viking die in the process, but he gained three glory points and he grabbed a gold. Now he gets to keep this card. I'll show you why in a second, we'll come back. The red dude, uh, he didn't defeat him. He got a blank and he fights back and he loses the die, so he doesn't get anything at all. This guy stays here. You'll notice that there's uh, these two cards. There's a red and a yellow. And if I can look through the deck here, I also have a blue. So you notice there's red, yellow, and blue draugers. So at the end of the game, you'll get an additional five points for every complete set of draugers. Uh, additionally, there are destiny cards that allow you to have um, uh, get additional uh, points, uh, end game points, for having the most uh, draugers of a particular color, color, like the most red, the most blue, uh, what have you. So that's those spaces. The runesmith, when you place your worker there, you're going to pay a wood to the supply, and you're going to get to choose either one of the two face-up cards, and if you didn't like either of those, you could choose uh, the face-down card, you know, blindly. And these give you special abilities that you can use one time during the game. They also get you uh, glory points, uh, in this case three, in this case two, and you get those points whether you use the card or not, but you only get to use the card once during the game. So for example, this one here lets, my, lets me uh, double my current coins up to a maximum of five, and this one lets me negate the losses suffered uh, by a single round of combat. Well, that's kind of cool. It means I get to keep a Viking if, uh, if I lose one or, or two or what have you. So that's, that's probably a nice card to have. And they would go in front of you when you get to use them, you know, when you'd like. The Sage House lets you do two things. The first thing you would do is you would take the top card of the deck and you keep this secret, but this is essentially a, a goal, uh, a secret goal that allows you to collect some points at the end of the game. Now you notice here this one is uh, whoever has the most monster cards. If I have the most monster cards at the end of the game, I'm going to get four points, four glory points. If I'm tied with someone else, then I'm only going to get two points. So it's a way to get some extra points at the end of the game. And you'd keep this uh, secret. The other thing it's going to allow you to do is look at what's called the journey cards. And I'm going to show you where the journey cards are in just a second. But they look like this. And they'll be face down. And these are basically obstacles that are uh, in front of your longships as you're making your way towards uh, the mountains trying to defeat uh, various monsters. And it will allow you to peek at one of them to see what you're going to face. Um, in one of those one of those slots and uh, give you kind of an upper hand a little bit of an advantage knowing what what these are I'll show you what these are in just a second all right so this center of the board here is where the majority of the worker placement actions are going to happen if I place my worker here on the stave church I can trade in um, a piece of gold and I can in return trade it out for a favor token which allows me to reroll my dice and I can trade in uh, three gold for two favor tokens uh, six for three and ten gold for four favor tokens. If I place here I get to become the first player on the next round and I also get a white die from the supply. If I go up to the market here this space allows me to trade a food, a gold, or a wood uh, for any of the others. So I could trade one wood for two gold or two food for two wood. You get the idea. It's a one-to-one -one ratio. Next uh, are these spaces here in the middle. We'll come back to this one in a minute. Uh, these are where we can collect dice. That shouldn't be there. That should be a red one. There we go. And if I were to place my worker here, I get to take this die, the swords, the swordman. Uh, the hafter gets me a spearman. If I go to the blacksmith, I take the axeman. If I go to the smokehouse, I get to take the food. Now, interesting thing happens. If nobody goes, say, here in the round, then the next time someone goes there, it's going to refill, and uh, in the next round, there'll be two Viking dice there. So it becomes much more valuable uh, the longer you wait to go there. So if no one uh, went to the smokehouse for three rounds, there'd be three uh, pieces of food there, and uh, I could come in and take all three food at one shot. So, so these spaces refill uh, when they don't get taken very much like uh, a worker placement game like Agricola or something like that. These spaces over here, these are randomized. Uh, in a four-player game, there's four tiles. In a three-player game, there's only three. In a two, there's two. 
and uh, they just allow for some uh, some variability. Um, you know, you shuffle these up and you can put them out. Uh, this one gets me uh, one gold. Uh, I pay one gold and I can take a white and a red die. This one here gets me two glory points straight away. And this one here lets me trade in one food for two white die. The last space here are the worker huts. So when a, a player puts their worker here, they would pay five gold and they get to have their their worker. So they get an extra worker, which is very valuable at the beginning of the game. Not so much at the end, which is why if uh, now the yellow player on the uh, subsequent round decides to go there, that player, she only has to pay four gold for her extra worker, and the third player pays uh, three, and the last lonely worker, whenever the blue player goes here, they'll only have to pay two gold to get uh, their fifth uh, worker. So that's the worker hut space. And the last thing we're going to talk about is we'll talk about the merchant ship area, which is just over here, as well as the shipwright and attacking monsters down here uh, south of this area that you can't see. Let's talk about that next. All right, down here on the second half of the board, this is where some of your battles uh, take place with these monsters down here or across the ocean. So let's show you how you get there. Before we do though, there's one last worker space I didn't cover. Uh, if you put a worker here, uh, you could in this case uh, pay one gold and you could get uh, two uh, black dice. And uh, at the end of the round, when the workers come back, this comes off the board and this gets refilled with a new card. So now this uh, merchant ship is now something else. So there's that. Uh, next are the long ships. I just put these out here just to display them out and just so I can talk about them. These are ships that you can purchase. So if you place a worker here on the ship right, you would pay uh, the associated cost of uh, wood and gold, and you'd get this ship. It has a capacity of seven, which we'll talk about in a minute. And at the end of the game, it's worth six glory points. And there's other ones here, but once you own them, you own them. They don't get destroyed or anything. You can use them uh, every round that you'd like to place them out uh, into the ocean and load them up with Vikings and food, which we'll show you how to do. Next are the monster cards. These monster cards would be out like so. Uh, in a two or three player game, they come out this far. In a four player game, we would add another one like so. This is the draw pile. And you'll notice that these cards are very similar to the Draugr and the, um, the Troll cards. Uh, they are, uh, you know, they have a, a, a value that you're trying to beat. Of course, they do a lot more damage to your Vikings. Whoops, there we go. And they're worth far more glory points, and uh, they also give you some extra bonuses, in this particular case, a favorite token. So they're worth more. They're harder to kill, and they're worth more points because they're harder to get to. <coughs> now, what do I mean by harder to get to? Well, let's say I had... Uh, now, what do I mean by harder to get to? Well, before we can attack these monsters, we have to get ourselves a ship, whether it be one of the private ones or one of these two public ones. This is a capacity of five. This is a capacity of 10, but I have to pay a gold to use it. So let's say I had, uh, let's say I had done this one here, this public long ship. And the capacity of five means I can have up to five things on it, which means uh, I could put, let's say, five dice on, three dice on it like that, and two food. Now, why is two food important? Well, we're going to show you why. Uh, additionally, down here, there are these journey cards. And if you remember, uh, back up at the Sage House, uh, you would pull a Sage card, Sage House card, to give you uh, some kind of objective to go towards. But it also allows you to peek at one of these. And these are basically obstacles that you have to overcome before you can even attack this monster here. So, for example, this one here, uh, this one here is an all quiet. So that's kind of nice. So if you had known that, if you had taken a peek at this and you known it was all quiet, then this is probably the space that you would want to go for, as opposed to maybe something like this. Um, uh, this particular one here, you have to fight off a Kraken first with your dice. If you beat it, you'll get three uh, glory points. Then you can fight this monster. So that can be difficult. 
So the first thing that has to happen is first you would, if you once you, all your workers are placed and you're ready to do combat and combat goes from the trolls to the droggers and then finally down to this area of the board. And when you're ready to fight, you would first reveal the journey card. And you'll notice it's all quiet, so that's good. Next, I have to pay food. In this particular fit, uh, case, I have to pay one food for every two Vikings. So I have to pay, uh, in this case, two food because I have three Vikings. Well, I have my two food, so I pay that to the supply, and now I can roll dice to try to defeat uh, this uh, uh, Rimthurs, I guess you'd call him. Now I roll the dice like so. So I got all blanks, for example. So unfortunately, because I rolled all blanks, um, I really want to re-roll using one of my favorite tokens if I have one right now. Now, why do I want to do that? Again, he has a three up here, which means he's going to destroy these three dice, which means this whole voyage here was for naught. So I'll spend the favorite token, token and I'll roll again. And this particular case, again, uh, didn't work out so well. I got two hits, which is enough to kill him. Uh, it's enough to kill him, and but he's going to wipe out uh, my entire uh, Viking party, which is okay, I guess. It still means I get to keep this, and again, a yellow border, right? Blue, red, and yellow gets you additional points. I would get 11 glory points around the outside uh, scoring track, and I would get uh, another favor token, and I would keep this card. And that would be that battle, and that would be it. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, other players would do the same thing if they were also down here on their ships and resolve their battle. At the end of the round, uh, this would come off and a new journey card would go in its place and a new monster would be revealed. Additionally, at the end of the round, uh, this public longship would go back here for someone else to use on another turn. And if you were using one of your private longships, it would go back uh, in front of you next to your character card uh, for use in another round. You would then uh, calculate you know, who has the most glory points based on uh, who has uh, these runesmith cards, who has, you know, you add those in. You would also add in uh, any additional bonus points for uh, Select set collection um, or any secret objectives, and additionally, uh, glory points here. Uh, excuse me, favor tokens are worth uh, one. Uh, each one of these is worth two glory points, and if you have coins, every three coins is worth one glory point. And the player with the most uh, glory points would be the winner, right? But then don't forget, you're going to have to add in these blame tokens, or not add, but actually subtract them in. Um, and like I said before, earlier, the more you have of these, uh, the worse it gets. So this is the last thing you do. So you add up all your glory points, then come in and subtract this, and the player with the most glory points wins the game. All right, that's Champions of Midgard. So let's talk about a couple of the negatives first before we talk about the positives. And they're, they're nitpicky. They're, they're not really a big deal, but you should know about them. Uh, the first is um, there were some complaints when the game came out that the food cubes and the wood cubes are too close in color. And I kind of agree with that. Um, if you're in a darkened uh, room trying to play this game, it can be hard to differentiate between the two. But not that you couldn't switch out one of them with some other color. It's not a big deal, but I'm putting that out there. They are pretty close, but <clears throat> I don't think it was a big deal. Uh, the next is when I open the box, and I think a lot of people have this problem, when you rip open the cards, all the cards are going to bend. They're all going to curl, and apparently that's due to moisture in the game when the game was sealed and uh, published and then sealed by the manufacturer. So what you might have to do is you'll take all the cards out, you're like, oh, they're fine, and then you'll notice if you lay them down, they're going to start to curl up. And um, you're going to have to lay them all out, let them dry out for a few hours, and flip them like pancakes. That's what I had to do until they all dry out. <clears throat> that can take time, excuse me, then take like a day or two um, to do that. It's kind of a pain, uh, but it will happen. I've sleeved some of the bigger cards, as you saw, but the smaller ones I don't have sleeves for, but um, people have told me that might help as well. The last negative thing is uh, the rule book. Uh, the rule book isn't great. I think if you're new to the hobby, um, you'll read the book going, oh, okay, I know how to play this, and you'll probably play it wrong uh, because some things are really vague. 
And um, this is the second printing of the game, so I'm kind of surprised that they haven't fixed some of the vagueness in the rules or some questions. Um, I know on Board Game Geek in the forums there have been some uh, errata changes and and um, you know updates uh, because people have had questions. And um, hopefully in another edition they'll fix um, issues with the rule book. So it's not a huge deal. But if you've played these kind of games before, it, it's not as big of an issue. But I think if you're new to the hobby, and this is a light game, so uh, someone who is new would pick something like this, um, they might have a problem. So uh, this game was given the Seal of Excellence from the Dice Tower. I don't know if that means anything, uh, to be honest with you, but um, it is an excellent game. It is a lightweight worker placement game. It borders on medium, but not so much. Um, but it's cool, and it's very, um, you know, it's very typical of a worker placement game. You have a worker pool, you're going to take one and you're going to place it, next person is going to place theirs, and you take the associated action or get the associated benefit. And then as time goes on, you're going to be getting dice maybe on some of those spaces, which are Viking warriors, and some Vikings are better than others, some attack better than others, some can defend better than others, and then you're going to take those dice and you're going to put them on the different uh, the different uh, enemies and then you're going to uh, roll the dice and hope for the best and hope that you can defeat the enemy uh, before he defeats you. And I kind of skipped that portion out uh, in the tabletop demonstration, I apologize, but th the, the course of events is each player in turn places a worker. When all the workers are done, then you, uh, whatever dice you've accumulated, you can then optionally place your dice on the worker spaces that have uh, uh, an enemy like the troll or the dragger or the uh, or the long ships that you're attacking uh, across the ocean to the to the to the monsters on the other side and then you're going to roll those dice and maybe play a favor token to roll it again uh, to defeat it and gain glory points i kind of glossed over that and i apologize um, but <clears throat> one of the cool things about the game <clears throat> excuse me is that i mean this game lasts eight rounds so it doesn't wear out its welcome it goes really fast and what can happen is you can place all your workers, get all your dice, and sit there and say, well, I'm not going to place any dice this turn. I'm going to skip it. I know I'm going to get a, um, a blame token, which I'll talk, to, talk about in just a second. And then on the next round, then I'm going to have these, this big horde of eight dice, and I'm going to attack this monster or attack over there and gain lots of points. So you have to kind of think about that as a strategy, whether you want to go for the short returns right away and getting points, or hold back and try to do a, a big, uh, you know, a big couple of battles in, in the next round. So you have to think about that. So the blame portion, um, the blame uh, mechanism. I think in a two-player game, the blame uh, mechanism isn't great because if you know if I'm playing with my son and he goes there, well, I know I'm going to get a blame token. There's nothing I can do to stop it. So I'm already one point behind. So I got to make it up somewhere else, right? Um, whereas if I'm playing a three or four player game and someone takes a troll space, then they can, usually what will happen is they'll assign blame to whoever has the most points who's over ahead, just as a way, as a reverse catch up mechanism, you know, to make them fall backwards closer to where you are in points. So I like that concept a lot. It's a little bit to take that, it's a little brutal, but um, I think. In this, in the, in this Viking sense of being, you know, uh, you know, in battles and and taking no prisoners kind of thing, it makes sense. And I think uh, that blame mechanism works really great with three and four players. I also think the game works uh, better with more players than with less. You can play this two player absolutely, but you noticed on the board there's so many different things you can do, and the board is just really loose. So if you're playing with only two players, um, yeah, there's only two market stalls that come out instead of the three or four, depending upon the number of players. But with two players, the board isn't tight enough. There's so many things you can do that it's never a question of, oh man, I really wanted to go there, now what do I do? I don't know, you know, there's no big decisions like that. In a three or four player game, especially a four, the board tightens up a lot. Now you have a problem of now where do I go because those two spaces are taken. I really wanted those. I got to come up with a different, a different game plan. So again, it works good for two players, works way better for three and four. Um, I know that when I played the game with my son, which I played a lot with him, um, on a two player game, we never went after the middle uh, portion there to gain an extra worker. Um, never even bothered with that. We saved our money and did, did other, th other things. Um, it really wasn't necessary. Um, I don't know if maybe you've played the game and you've done that, but um, 
<clears throat> on a two-player game, that, that space with the extra worker is virtually useless. We just never used it. Uh, and again, I think it's because although the game works as two-player, I think it's better with more. So uh, it's a good uh, worker placement game. Um, it's got that dice chucking aspect with so that, you know, that randomness and that, that roll the dice and hope that you win kind of feel, which can be exciting. Um, it's all good. And it's light, light medium, but really a light game. Um, I think it's a lot of fun. It's going to stay on my shelf for a long time because um, my son's a big Viking fan. I think my daughter will like it too. And I think Gray Fox has an opportunity here to add expansions for. There's so many opportunities here where you can add... Uh, additional cards or additional additional market stalls, um, maybe a sideboard with additional spaces, um, all kinds of different things or different dice or what have you. There's a lot of opportunity here, I think, for this very thematic game that Gray Fox can add expansions um, to add replayability, add difficulty, um, and, and a challenge, and and create a, a, and keep creating uh, this new game almost every time uh, with expansions. Uh, I think it'd be a good thing. I hope they do that. I don't know what their plans are, but if I work for them, I would say, yes, create expansions, do it. So that's it. That's Champions of Midgard. So if you have any questions or comments, please put them in the box below, or you can email me at completelybored at gmail.com, and I will try to answer them uh, as soon as I can. Thank you so much for watching. See you next time.